Thank you. So thanks for staying till the end of this uh, workshop, where you heard a lot about machine learning. So now, you know, what has the physics to do with that? So, so to kind of motivate it before going to physics, so my first slide is my collaborators, and the ones in blue are especially the ones whose work I will be presenting later on. But to go to that motivation, I start with a few a bit philosophical slides. So, so I think it's fair to say that kind of what we have seen in, in the last 20 years in machine learning, this like amazing revolution in deep learning that is bringing a lot of uh, excitement in industry and, and in all like applied sectors, I would call it an engineering progress because kind of the, the, the process of engineering is you have a well-defined objective in, you know, example could be to reach a good accuracy in classification on ImageNet. And then you're creating, a s your goal is to create a system that reaches that objective. So here I just snapshot from Google the current system that is the state-of-the-art classifier of images from ImageNet which is a neural network called FixResNetXT101, okay? And it's a work from this year. This was from last week. I hope it didn't change since. Maybe it did. And, and so, so, so this is working and it's doing great. And based on the same principles, we can do many other things. But now, if I look at it from the point of view of, you know, by background, I'm a theoretical physicist. I would like to understand how, say, black holes work or don't work and how universe was created. So if I ask a question, how does this network work? I mean, I can code it, I can see the code, what it does, but how to choose the architecture, how to choose the algorithm, what properties of the data actually make it work, it's very fair to say that we just have no clue, basically. We are in the infancy of understanding that. So. Okay, so why do we need to understand? One way, you know, one kind of, somebody could say, you know, we don't need to understand. It's working and it can bring us, you know, success, money, whatever is your measure of what you want. Sure, that's one way to answer. But, you know, there are people in the world who still want to understand. I think understanding is kind of the, the, the internal drive for many of us. So, so here I give you a, little piece of an article that I have read recently with three of questions that I think are very important to understand about deep learning and how it works that we don't yet understand. So to go through them, why don't heavily parameterized neural networks overfit the data? So if you went through some courses in, uh, in say, statistics or data analysis, you learned about the variance bias trade-off. If you have more parameters, then you are basically fitting the noise and you are hurting your generalization error. That's kind of what we learn very early when we are uh, learning about machine learning. The mystery of deep neural networks is that this doesn't seem to be the case. We are, we are training the, 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 the models that are hugely overparameterized. The number of parameters is sometimes way bigger than the number of samples or the dimension or any of these numbers. Yet we are not hurting the generalization error. It seems the generalization error keeps decreasing. So where does it come from? The second question, what is really here the effective number of parameters? So if, for instance, we are thinking of something like classifying ImageNet, there is the dimension of the image, the number of pixels, but surely the whole set of images don't live in that high dimensional space. There is some subspace in that space that they cover. And how to kind of define the effective dimension here, that would some number that would then directly translate to something like how many samples do we need to be able to learn uh, with the given accuracy to the sample complexity. We don't really have understanding of that in any like usable way. And the third question, why is backpropagation, that is just a very silly gradient descent in the loss landscape, not heading for a pure local minima because these loss landscapes are non-convex and very complicated, yet we are heading to some, maybe not minima, but to some space in that landscape that generalizes well. So what is kind of influencing the dynamics here? So I have read that article recently, but it was kind of striking and making my point about how you know we didn't move so much in the 20 years as much we did on the engineering side, is that this snapshot comes from an article called Reflections After Referring Papers for NIPS, back then it was still called this way, that was 
written by Leo Breimann in 95. So this is 25 years ago. And these are still the currently, you know, kind of pressing questions about how really these systems and why they are working. So they are still not answered. So to continue, two more slides on this kind of more philosophical inter introduction, is how do we go towards the theory of deep learning? What, do, what is missing? Why is it so difficult? So I kind of like to put it in this kind of diagram that it's an interplay of three ingredients. So when you think about deep learning, there is the algorithm, the backpropagation if you want, there is the data structure, and there is the architecture. And they really must go hand in hand why is, uh, to, to understand how really these things are working and why. So why is it so, right? So say that we would not put, we would not put into the consideration the algorithm. Well, then we are in the realm of something like approximation theory or learning theory, but if we are not putting the algorithm in, then we have no guarantees that these are actually tractable problems. It can take exponential time to reach whatever we can prove solutions exist. So we do need to keep the algorithm in mind, because otherwise we are heading to exponential time in the dimension, and that's just not what's happening, and that's not, that would not be interesting. On the side of the data structure, it, you know, we need to model the structure in the data. If you are not doing that, then what is going on? is that we have uh, works back 30 years ago, 25 years ago, in computer science that tells us that even very simple architectures are NP comp or simple problems are NP hard to train, meaning that there is kind of an adversarial set of data, data set for which we do not have polynomial, we widely believe we do not have polynomial algorithms. But clearly, you know, this is a worst case setting, so we could say like in practice, this worst case doesn't arrive. But what do we really need from the data to be, what is the magic property of the data that doesn't make them worst case? Like we don't know. And if we don't put the data in, then we are including in the modeling the worst case. So then again, deep learning cannot be working in such generality. And finally, the architecture. So that's a little bit like less clear why that should be from the theoretical point of view. We don't really have a proof that we really need multi-layer, say, more than two layers neural networks. But kind of the empirical evidence seems overwhelming that having many layers is advantageous and without having many layers is not working so well. So then we better consider the architectures that kind of correspond to the, to the current ones. So somehow to illustrate that these three ingredients that we need to be considering together are, of, are not considered together, is that I put in this diagram the kind of traditional theoretical fields that are studying things related to machine learning. Right? So computer science and optimization theory deals with the algorithm, but ignores the data structure and the architecture often, most, you know, most of the time. The data structure would be studied in, say, statistics would be assuming models on the data structure, information theory, signal processing, but for instance, statistics, you know, it's fair to say that ignores the algorithm in the sense that traditionally statistics worked in low dimension, and if the dimension is five and the algorithm is exponentially in five, is not such a big deal. So high dimensional statistics also is very hard to actually take into account both the structure of the data and the algorithm. And on the architecture size, we have all these like well-known results in approximation theory that are telling us that the function that neural network represents is generic enough and can, rep and can approximate very generic class of functions. And learning theory is telling us something about how this is working from the point of view of the generalization error. But they are not taking into account the algorithm and they are not taking into account the stru data structure, not explicitly. So they are basically not communicating. So of course, these days, people are realizing that without taking these three directions together, we are, it will be hard to move on. And I just give you here a reference to a talk by Elhanan Mossel this year in, in Simon's Institute in Berkeley, where he, so he doesn't put it exactly the same way, but he has similar three ingredients. And he goes even farther than I do. He like takes the list of kind of influential theory papers in the last, say, two years. And he, and he rates them for each of the three ingredients. He, he, he says like how well they are taking it into account. And you kind of see that there are many that are like 900 zero zero or 91 or, or zero 091, uh, that basically always there is one or two of the ingredients. So, 
Okay, to go to the physics now. So how is kind of physics like helping us with that? So first of all, you know, where does kind of the, you know, the where, where does physics come from? So uh, the relation between machine learning and physics. So I like to illustrate that in a in a Facebook uh, post of Jan Lecan from uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, after giving a lecture at a, at a conference we organized in Caches that was called Statistical Physics and Machine Learning Back Together. And in that post he's saying, you know, there is a long history of theoretical physicists bringing ideas and mathematical methods to machine learning, neural networks, probabilistic inference, such problems. And with the prevalence of deep learning and the theoretical questions that surround it, as discussed before, physicists are coming back. And you know, this, ah, this school is for them. And in his lecture at that school, he kind of uh, demo uh, he kind of demonstrated this claim by his personal story that he attended this conference in Lesouch, which is like the these are two, the two best places for conferences in France, at least in my opinion, in '85, so a long time ago. And he was saying that back in '25, he was you know young researcher interested in neural networks, and nobody in say the computational fields would listen to him because you know, neural networks were not supposed to be working, etc. And he says that the only people he could have interesting discussions and you know, kind of forward-looking discussions were actually the physicists. So he went to this conference in 85. It, it, there was called Disordered Systems and Biological Organization. And here I just put it few, like uh, there is a proceeding of this conference, so there are 40 uh, lectures there. And you know, I put just some examples here. So you see there is Jan Lecan's lecture here. And then many of you will know, for instance, uh, Isabel Guillaume, and then, and then there is John Hopfield that is kind of universally known. You know, he's a physicist by background. And then the physicists in the audience will know Marc Mezard and Vera Soro and Gerard Weisbuch, especially the, the French ones. So, so you know, the community was back there, but was there already kind of back then? Okay, but so. You know, but so far I didn't say anything about what, what we are actually trying to do. So to proceed with that, I want to make like one point about what we mean and how do we use the concept of a model in, say, data science and in physics. So in data science, model would be some kind of a ansatz for a function that you're trying to fit to your data. So you believe that you know this is some function that is like, closely enough explaining where the actual data that you have come from. So for instance, I don't know if you do linear regression, you're fitting the best straight line that captures the dependence on y of on x, so the straight line is the mall. But in physics, we would not really call that the mall, we would maybe call that ansatz. In physics, malls is something else, like it's something that really serves, it's, it's really something reducing the complexity of the problem to the absolute minimum necessary to explain kind of the salient features of what's going on. And crucially, it's totally fine if in physics the models are actually not describing the real data. So, so to illustrate that, I give you here the example that you know, we teach to every like, master's student in physics, which would be the Isaac model, that explains the notion that the magnetism is something that there is a phase transition in magnets that if you take a magnet and heat it up to say 700 uh, kelvin or celsius i don't remember then it will stop to be a magnet so there is a phase transition from the magnetic to the paramagnetic phase and explaining such a property you know we teach this ising model which is basically here is reduced to, to a probability measure on binary variables that is uh, that is a, that is a Oh, as I said, probability uh, measure with this function here being, you know, some simple function of these variables. So it's not that we really believe that magnets, you know, interact this, that, that s s spins in magnets interact this way. Well, they don't. I mean, we have all quantum mechanics of how actually they do interact, and it's way more complicated than this, right? But reducing it to something like that reproduces the phase transition. It doesn't do it at all at the right temperature, but kind of the notion of what's going on is there. So, so, so that's the whole point here. We would like to have some mall for the architecture, the data, and the algorithm that kind of keeps the salient features of what's going on in deep learning, but that is analyzable, that is tractable analytically, for which we can compute things. So 
you know, that's basically said here. So we aim to reproduce the salient behavior in the, of the real system. And how do we do this? It usually it's not like the first idea that we come up that is the right one. That it's an iterative process. We like try a model, look how it behaves, something is missing there. So we put it in, in the same way as say, you know, general relativity improved uh, Newton's, uh, Newton's law by realizing that at high speeds and uh, high gravitational pull, it's not quite working. So okay, maybe, you know, maybe not so ambitious, but that's, that's the idea. Okay, so, so what is the start of such a model? So what is the simpler question we want to ask that then we believe you know, will make us understand something about deep learning? So, so the model that is often looked at and that I think is like a really good start is this question of a teacher-student neural network. So when can a neural network learn a teacher neural network? So to define this question, you actually, so you consider a teacher neural network that has a fully connected feedforward architecture, something simple, basic, and the input data x would just be random IID vectors. So, so you know, not only the samples are IID one from another, that's a usual assumption, but each of the samples is itself just IID noise, if you want. Just the images would be just IID noise. And then you feed in these uh, samples. The network, you somehow, you, you chose its weights to some ground true weights, W star, that for simplicity also take random IID. So these are just IID numbers. And you generate the labels Y. And you have a given number of samples, N, of dimension P. And that's a teacher network. So its purpose is just to generate the data set. It's a completely artificial, synthetic, uninteresting data set. Right? And then the question is, if you take a student network that, say for simplicity, has the same architecture or not, you know, this will be something that we can be playing with, and you presented the samples of X and Y, so the usual way, you have inputs, labels, you present it to the architecture and you run your favorite algorithm to learn the weights, can this network learn the same function that the teacher network was representing? Okay, so that's a very concrete question, stripped of all many important things such as the fact that the data have structure, that you know, here I didn't really specify the algorithm and the architecture I'm taking is very, you know, the most basic one, just feed forward, fully connected neural net. Okay, so, but said like that, like with the multi-layer neural network, mathematically even that question is actually quite complicated. So we will get to it, what we can say and what we know and how, how it's kind of going to the, to the real thing that we would like to understand. So before going kind of to the study of this, of this model of the teacher-student network in physics, I just want to give you here like two, two slides saying that it's not only kind of a bizarre thing in physics that, that we are thinking about, that this teacher-student kind of problem is becoming quite you know, popular in, in, say, the mainstream of machine learning, for instance. Last year on the Francis AI conference, Joshua Benjo was giving a talk about natural language processing and he was kind of reflecting on what we are missing, what, what do we need to be able to go forward in natural language processing. And so here I'm just zooming on his slide. And in order to, to like motivate this reflection, he was giving this example of a planet where the communication between the aliens is happening in a noiseless way. So you know, their atmosphere is such that when they speak to each other, there is no noise. And so over the years, these, you know, we are optimizing our speech on being understood, but also on not making the sentences way too long. If we can transmit the information in a shorter way, we will do it. But on Earth, we cannot do it because there is noise in the communication. So we kind of you know, settled on some like uh, trade-off. But there, those aliens, they have no noise. So over their evolution, they actually developed a language where the information they are communicating to, to their peers is compressed in a completely optimal way so that the messages are the shortest possible. And now, as you know, if you take any signal and you compress it in an optimal way, then the compressed file is just IID. The, it just looks indistinguishable from IID noise, right? Because if it didn't, it means there are still some correlations that you can compress it further. So if it is compressed optimally, it's, it's indistinguishable from IID. 
And, and he was reflecting on how would we go about natural language processing in a world like that? Because currently we are so much exploiting the structure of the language rather than actually the correlation between the language and the labels. So, so that <laughs> I was just amused to see that because that would be exactly kind of the teacher-student setting. And another, another case of, uh, say, direction where people are considering this setting is in the very like theoretical side of uh, theory of learning here represented by Sanji Farah, who is in Princeton, who may be less known than Joshua Benjo, but kind of he's like the icon of the theory of learning and optimization these days. And he also, last year at ICML tutorial, was kind of illustrating this, this, this riddle of, uh, of, of over-parametrization helping on the teacher-student network saying, okay, it's quite strange that the teacher, that it seems to be better that the, uh, that the it seems better that the student is larger than the teacher in order to learn the student. Because kind of from a Bayesian inference point of view, if we know the generative process, we, we should match the estimator to the generative process. But in neural network learning, it seems not to be the case. It seems to be easier to actually manage with a you know, different generative, different estimator that in a sense corresponds to a larger neural network. Okay, so to go, you know, so this is from last year, but the model in physics is studied since a long time. So concretely since 89, in, a, in a, the work of Gardner and Terida, but back then they didn't study the multi-layer case. They studied the simplest possible version where you don't even have hidden variables. So the teacher is you know, generating labels by taking the input data, multiplying by a vector of weights, and say applying a sign function here and outputting the label. And the goal of the student is then to reconstruct the same function or the, 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 the vector of weights, that's one way to reconstruct the same function, from the sample of, of, of x and y. So this in a sense, is a generalized linear regression because linear regression, this function would be just linear function, and here it's a, a sign. And what's more interesting is that, you know, in 89, very little of the actual statistics was high dimensional. That's a long time ago, right? High dimensional statistics, people realize that it's relevant and important, and do some things are doable kind of maybe later. But they were in the high, you know, what we would call today the high dimensional setting where the number of samples and the number of, and the dim number of dimension are both large and comparable to each other. Their ratio is some constant. So that's kind of interesting that in physics this is the very natural limit from like very early on. And what they were able to compute or a follow up work but the same work or a year or just a year after, they were able to compute something that we would love to have in something like deep learning but we are very, very far from being that. But for a simple model like that, they were able to compute the optimal generalization error that any algorithm is able to reach as a function of this parameter alpha that was the number of samples divided by the dimension. And this is for a case where the teacher weights happen to be binary vectors. And in this particular case, for instance, they realized that the best generalization error that we can reach with even exponentially costly algorithms actually has a jump at the well-defined value of this parameter alpha, uh, this one. And this, you know, in a physics sense, this is a phase transition, just like water is, say, freezing or, or evaporating. Uh, this is a first order phase transition in the generalization property, irrespectively of how good is the algorithm. This is an information theoretic statement. So, so there is something you know, interesting that we can compute, and they did it, oh yeah, I write it here, with, with, uh, with somehow an analysis method called the replica method. So now I will jump, you know, I could stay 30 years ago for a long time, but I will jump to today and kind of summarize what is our progress on this type of, uh, of, this type of model today. So you know, we, we, have a, we have kind of a formula for this generalization error for any activation function and general class of priors of the teacher weights. And we actually also have a algorithm that is matching or not, and we have a good understanding of when it does and when it doesn't, this optimal performance. That's a polynomial, tractable algorithm. And we also have a proof that this formula actually is the right formula 
because back then this was you know, without kind of the epsilon and delta results. And you know, rather than showing you like how these formulas look like, I want to show you some examples of what is how this generalization error behaves to kind of motivate uh, the next part. So for instance, in a case where the activation function is a sign and the teacher weights are just Gaussian, the red curve is the optimal generalization error. The black dots is the performance of the approximate message passing algorithm and the theory tells us that they should agree, they do agree. And the blue uh, squares is the performance of uh, uh, logistic regression just taken from scikit-learn, you know, some black box that doesn't know anything about the model, and you see that in this case is actually very close to the optimal performance. So if it always looked like that, you know, there would be not much to be improving upon. But it doesn't always look like that. So for instance, this is the case where I only, the only thing I change, I take the teacher weights binary, so that was also five, sli five slides ago, and in this case, things are a bit different. So red curve is the optimal performance. So that's the one I already showed you. Black points is the performance of the approximate message passing. And the green curve is the analysis of what this algorithm does. And you see that there is a gap between the red and the green. That's kind of a hard phase where we believe that no polynomial algorithm would actually get that generalization error. But what's maybe even more interesting is the blue points, that's again the result of the black box ro logistic regression, that are totally not picking this behavior here. Right? They are just decreasing slowly down and not picking that something interesting could be happening here. So there is a gap between the optimal performance and the performance of the logistic regression here. But there are some cases that are even worse. You know, you could say logistic regression is a bit weak. It's not a very good classifier. But in this case, where we again take teacher weights binary, and the activation function this time is what we call the symmetric door. So we take a sign of absolute value of the scalar product minus some constant, such that half of the labels are plus one and half of them are minus one. Then you know we have our theory that is pretty much saying a similar thing as before. But in the inset, we actually tried to solve this classification problem with uh, you know, multi-layer neural networks. And we were, you know, we were kind of managing to some generalization error that was, say, you know, 20% or so. But we needed way more samples than the optimal method needed. So here we are needing just barely more uh, samples than the dimension. And the neural net needed at least 10 times more sample than dimensions, and, and the error was still not very good. So there, there is a big gap, right? And this is a very simple model. So we would like to understand in practice what is this gap, how far from the optimality we are, and how much can we still improve these systems, or maybe not, etc. OK, so you know, to wrap up a little bit, this was a very simple model. So is this bringing us anywhere close to the theory of deep learning? So let me go back to this diagram, where we are in this diagram. So what I just described is in blue, is you know, the input data were IID vectors, and the outputs were teacher outputs. So that's not a very realistic uh, data structure. The architecture had no hidden units, so that's not explaining what deep learning is doing. And the algorithm was not even the, alg the back propagation, but it was this message passing type of algorithm. So what we would like to get is to analyze gradient descent based algorithms, have some realistic structure, and analyze the multi-layer case. So now in the remaining time, oh, I said that building the right model is kind of an iterative process on improving the existing ones. So I take the simplest possible case that we have so far and go once through the loop. And then you know we probably need to go several times to kind of build something satisfactory. So I will go once through the loop, starting on this side of putting in the hidden variables. So what can we do on that side? So yes, we can generalize this, uh, you know, these results and put in hidden layers and variables. But so far, in a quite limited case, where still the number of samples and the dimension are both large with a fixed ratio, but now the number of hidden units is of order one. So they can be five or 100, but they need to be order one while these two numbers go to infinity. The, 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 the expressions that we derive are var valid in that limit. And again, that's a, that's a case of a neural network that you know, in the physics literature was studied and suggested a long time ago. We kind of put it on a you know, rigorous ground and, and put it together with the, the algorithmic tractability and more with the current questions in the last NERIPS uh, paper. 
And you would think this is, you know, this is not much, but it's already something that is you know, putting to evidence some interesting facts that practitioners know about that I am illustrating on this slide. So here I take the simplest non-trivial case with just two hidden units. And when we analyze what's actually going on in terms of the optimal generalization error, we realize that in terms of the sample complexity, so how many samples per dimension we need, there is a you know, new type of a phase transition that separates the regime of just few samples where there is nothing better to do than linear regression. And if we have more samples than that, then actually doing learning with several hidden units, so doing more than linear regression, starts to get better performance. And this is again an information theoretic st statement, but in practice we know that if we have few samples, then most often deep learning is not very useful and just kernel ridge regression or something like that is basically something from which we get the best performance. And in order to get advantage from deep learning, well, it's kind of sample hungry. So, so again, this, you know, this number itself is not so meaningful because here the data, the input data are still IID, so this is not realistic, right? So the number itself is uh, maybe not interesting, but the concept that there indeed is a sharp defined transition between a regime where indeed, if you don't have enough samples, then information theoretically you cannot do better than linear regression. And if you do have more than that, then you actually can realize that the, the network can start realizing that there were two hidden units and then specializing them or separating them to their specific you know, features, if you want, is actually computationally, is actually better. So, so, so that's one thing that we can observe here. And if we go to a number of uni hidden units that is still much smaller than the dimension and the number of samples, but, bi but large, then in the generalization error as a function of the sample complexity, we have this computational gap again opening, uh, meaning that there must, that, that you know, from all we know from the kind of computational complexity uh, theory or average computational complexity theory, that there actually is a gap between what's algorithmically reachable and what is information theoretically reachable. And this is still kind of with the optimal algorithm. So here we are not saying anything, how does the black box algorithm, say the back propagation, compare to this. So I'm going back to that. So this was this side. So we moved a little bit. So you see I changed my blue from no hidden units to few hidden units. But we are still not quite yet there. We would like to deal with multiple kind of wide layers, not infinitely wide, but say extent like as wide as say the dimension or comparably wide to the dimension. And this, this seems to be currently a technical problem with our type of method to actually get there. So you know, we are working on it, but let's, you know, that's, that's this side, but I said I want to do the loop. So let's go to this, to this part of the algorithms. So far, I was kind of showing performance of the message passing algorithms, but you know, why should we care about them? Because they are kind of very sensible on the assumptions of the model and not so robust and generalizable to, to the real cases as the gradient descent based algorithms are. So, so kind of the big open question about, you know, so we all know that deep learning is fueled by gradient descent, it's all over the place. But gradient descent seems to be a very like abrupt way of solving this optimization problem in the highly non-convex uh, problem. And so, okay, but in practice it works well. So we would at least like to have some characterization of how well does it work. So, but you know, so far this is very difficult to actually get hand on, you know, have some close formula that tells us in this problem gradient descent will reach this generalization error. You know, we basically have very few of that here I list some like some keywords of like in linear networks we understand quite well and in some regime that people refer to as lazy training or the neural tangent kernel we understand a bit but in general we don't still understand so we wanted to advance on that question to take this kind of dynamics that is the gradient descent with the loss function here with the weight decay here or not in physics we call it spherical constraint and we can add a noise of zero mean and variance proportional to what in physics we call the temperature. If we did it and put this t equal to one, then this would be what's called the Langevin algorithm. 
that has the nice property that at large times is sampling the corresponding posterior measure. But that's most often not done, right? Most often there is no noise, so that's as if this t was zero. And then this equation corresponds to the gradient flow, so just the continuous time version of gradient descent. So can we analyze this gradient flow in some model and understand you know, where does it go in large constant time? So in the neural network, even the like teacher-student case, the simplest one, this actually was studied, but it was basically concluded that so far it's a very challenging mathematically problem. But we cooked up a model where we can do it, and which kind of we believe that the landscape of the loss function may be generic enough so that what's happening here is more generic. In physics, we like to use the word universal, but okay, what does it mean universal? But that's kind of a buzzword in physics. So what is this model? It's a, it's a kind of matrix tensor factorization problem. So actually some people use this model in the data science sense in, in topic modeling, where for instance, you have topics in a document and then you observe correlations between pairs of words and correlations between triples of words. So at the end you have this matrix and order three tensor. And then from these correlations you try to infer the topic. So that actually ends up very similar to what I'm writing here. So this is an inference problem when there is some signal X star, which later will be hidden and we will be inferring it, that we just take this vector X star and it's, out and it's you know, transpose and add a lot of noise to this. This n is large, and this is order one, and observe this matrix. And we do the same with a pupil of the components of the signal and noise here, and observe the tensor. And this leads kind of, if we wanted to solve it in a, you know, with the maximum likelihood method, then this would lead to a loss function of this type. That is actually known in physics under the name of mixed two plus p spherical spin glass model. So, okay, this may sound horrible if you never heard about spin glass models. But the key thing is that for a loss function like that, which is high dimensional, non convex, so a priori we have very little cue of what the gradient descent would do in a, in a loss function like that, we actually can write. Uh, closed form equations of what the gradient descent is doing. And the kind of inspiration for that, for those equations comes again from a physics work long time ago that you know is totally unknown I think in the machine learning literature, but it's very well known in the physics literature because that work stands at the basis of our understanding of glasses, the window glasses or structural glasses, how the dynamics of these materials actually works. So, so, so in that part of physics, this work is very known, and they, they write, uh, you know, on a very related model set of equations that that describe what the gradient descent is doing. I will show them on the next slide, and there is also this work on, you know, probabilists that some of them you might know, especially Alice, since she is in France, that actually prove that the equations they write are the right ones to describe the dynamics. And here is how those equations look like. You know, of course, not, do not expect you to understand, just to give you the idea. So they are written in terms of three kind of order parameters and are these integral differential equations. So it's nothing like super, you know, transparent. But there, the, dimension, the, the dimension that goes to infinity is already taken. It's not anymore there. So these are not anymore high dimensional equations. They're just some integrals but just one dimensional ones. So you need to solve them with some numerical software, right? But nothing super complicated. So we solve them. And then this gives us a following phase diagram. So what's on the axis? So here is the noise on the tensor, and here is one over the noise on the matrix. So this means that if both these noises are big, so we are somewhere here, oh sorry, here, here, then the signal is, ver is hidden in the noise. Nothing should be possible, and that's indeed the case. In this corner, we have a whole range of these parameters where information theoretically it's impossible to recover the signal from the observations. Then there is the hard phase here. Then this whole green region is a region where the approximate message passing would be working and recovering nicely the signal. But the gradient flow will be working only above this, this line here. That's the result of our analysis. Okay, so you know what's kind of the popular, say, optimization theory explanation of that? So the popular explanation is that as somehow the signal-to-noise ratio increases, 
This non-convex landscape has many spurious local minima that trap the gradient descent. And the good one that generalizes well is there, but it's kind of hidden by the spurious ones. And then we need to wait, 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 that the signal to noise ratio is so big that the spurious local minima all disappear. And then the only one that is left is the global one, and so the gradient descent happily goes there. And in the kind of line of work in, say, last five years in, say, computer science and kind of learning theory, there are many works trying to show that, un or, or showing, managing to show that under different conditions, neural networks lie in this regime, right? So there is kind of this underlying assumption that all the spurious local minima need to disappear for the algorithm to work. Okay, so now in this model, this model is so nice that we can actually completely characterize how many spurious local minima there are at a given, M here would be kind of the accuracy or analog of the accuracy, and a given likelihood, the, one, the likelihood corresponding to the tensor and the one corresponding to the matrix. So this again is a horrible formula, but we can exactly evaluate from this formula where this trivialization transition happens. Above which line we no longer have the spurious local minima. And if I plot it, it's a line like this. So it kind of has a similar shape as the line at which the gradient descent starts working, but crucially is not the same line. So this means that this popular explanation is not quite the right explanation, right? There is a region where there still are spurious local minima, but the gradient descent is not being blocked by them. So how to, you know, how to, how is this possible? So actually from our analysis of the equations, we can like look at it a little bit more. And we actually realize, you know, if you kind of look at the trajectories of how the loss function decreases as a function of time, we see that there are kind of plateaus on which we either are blocked or not, from which we escape. And these plateaus, if we escape from them, it's directly related to the rise of the accuracy during the run of the algorithm. And if we kind of put that into the equations, we can actually, this equation would mean, you know, where are these plateaus? And this equation would be, is it stable or unstable to stay on the plateau? And putting them together gives us a new expression. And if we plot that expression, that's actually the blue line. The black dots was numerical inter integration of the, of the uh, differential equations. So this is explaining what the gradient flow is doing. But that might sound a little bit like abstract, like what is it actually? So let me like correct this popular explanation into the right explanation. So it's not really about the spurious local minima being there. They might be there. What matters is where the dynamics goes and where it you know, would be blocked if it wouldn't be working. And it so happens that we can characterize where this is. This would be in the most numerous and highest lying local minima. And so what matters is whether those are stable or whether those have a you know, negative uh, gradient direction towards the minima that generalizes well or not. And this is precisely what we can analyze. So, so it's not about the existence of the spurious local minima somewhere there, but it's about where the gradient goes and whether those minima actually are or not unstable towards where we want to go. And so this is kind of correction of this, uh, of this um, you know, kind of explanation that is not quite right with just the spurious local minima. So just to conclude on this part, the gradient flow works even when spurious local minima are present sometimes. And we can quantify it using this Katz-Rice formula. And this is really, I think, first time that we have a like, kind of cl cl closed expression of a threshold up to which the gradient descent works. And kind of interesting question is whether we can do this beyond the present model. And it seems like we can because the final explanation we gave is kind of independent of being able to write these horrible integral differential equations. So that's what we are working on now. And I have a part about this third part. But before going to that, I need to ask how much time I have. Ten, I mean, 10 minutes till the end. But is there a time reserved for questions? Five minutes, good, that should be enough. Okay, five minutes before the questions. So to finish that loop, so now I put in blue that you know we can say something about the gradient descent, and again, learn 
you know, some high level information from it, like that is not really the, the spurious locum minima that bothers us so much. And so about the structure in the data. So to kind of first persuade you that, you know, clearly there is a structure in the data, but why do we need to take it into account to describe how the learning is working? So to persuade you that this is the case, I show you two sets of experiments that we did on the simple teacher-student model and on MNIST with really, really simple neural network which just has few hidden units, one hidden layer and few hidden units. In this case, I think it was four. So not much, okay? And I just want to demonstrate the kind of difference between the learning dynamics in this model and in MNIST. And then I want to create a model that actually does not present these differences. So the first difference, so if you train on MNIST, and this is the orange curve here, the generalization error, if you actually measure it as you train, right? So we usually don't do that, but here for the purpose of plotting this, I did that. As, an, as, a, as, a, as a function of the number of epochs, you know, not, nothing much is happening. I mean, it just keeps decreasing. And, and this is, it just keeps decreasing and nothing, you know, nothing particular is happening in it. Whereas if we do it on the teacher-student model, there is a well-known phenomena that, uh, that was described again a long, long time ago in the physics literature, that there is a kind of plateau for uh, all, uh, you know, long time in the training time where the generalization error is not decreasing much and then it decreases suddenly and very fast goes to, to kind of stationary point. There is a stationary here because we put some noise on the output. Okay, the, I can, okay. If you're interested, I could tell you the details of how exactly we train the learning rate and all that. But just to say, you know, in teacher-student, there are plateaus in the learning dynamics, and in the usual case, you know, in the kind of practical cases, we don't see those plateaus. So that's one difference that we are not happy about. It's not a good model because we don't want it to be like crucially different. And another difference that is illustrated on this picture is that so on MNIST we did this following thing. So we train it you know, in the usual way, just few hidden units. But what's unusual is that we train it twice from different initial from different in seed, which means that the random initialization is just differently random. So we train these two independent students or two independent uh, you know, neural networks. And then we plot the generalization error as a function of the number of hidden units, which is the blue, so it decreases a bit, okay, nothing particular. And it's not particularly small because the neural network is very simple, so it's about 10% error, so which is not great. But that's not the point here. And then we plot uh, the orange curve, which is how often these two independently trained neural networks agree on the MNIST test images. And we see that they agree, uh, you know, for few hidden units almost always, and for more hidden units, you know, uh, basically as often as is the generalization error. So that kind of makes sense. You know, you learn something about the data set and you agree hence often on it. But what's interesting is that if you compare the output of these two independently trained students on not the MNIST test data, but on random IID vector, then they basically never agree. They agree as often as uh, you know, random functions would agree. So in half of the cases, this is just binary classification between odd and even digits in MNIST. So what is this saying to you is that the two independent students, even in such a simple case, actually do not learn the same function. They learn the same function on the manifold kind of on which MNIST lies, or kind of close to the manifold. If you approximate the MNIST data set by a manifold in the input space on which it lies, there they agree. But on the rest of the input space, they just don't agree. They just behave to each other like two random functions. But, cr but this is not reproduced in the teacher and student uh, model because in the teacher and student model, the student is exactly learning the, the weights of the teacher. So it's just learning the same function on the whole input space, which is demonstrated here. You know, the green points, they just go to zero as long as, as soon as the number of uh, student hidden units is bigger or equal to the number of teacher hidden units. So again, a difference that we would like to get rid of. And to get rid of it, we need to come up with a better model. So we call it the hidden manifold model, which is, you know, we, we kind of mimic the intuition of what's happening in MNIST, but 
In which way? Well, in a way that still kind of keeps the structure so that we can write our theory and analyze it with the same methods. And so what is this model? The input data will not be any more axes that are IID random as they were in the teach vanilla kind of teacher student model, but there will be some nonlinear function on product of two random IID matrices. And the intermediate dimension here will be some D, which will be much smaller than the dimension P of the input space. So the, you know, later on I will be using D equal 10 and input space is like say in MNIST like 700 something and number of samples is say 60,000 like in, in MNIST. And then the labels, you know, in the teacher student model we, we were just feeding the inputs into a teacher network. But doing that is not will not reproduce, and I, mean, I can show you, or maybe I will not have time, but we show that it's not reproducing what we are observing. What we need, we need the labels to be generated using this latent representation C. So there is a teacher network generating the labels, but it's not acting on the input space, but on kind of the coordinate space of this, space of this hidden manifold. And if we do it this way, so we'll go fast, now this is the picture for MNIST that you have seen already, it looks exactly the same if you do the same experiment on this hidden manifold model. That the two independent students are learning the same function on the submanifold, but not on the rest of the input space. And when it comes to this plateau, so this is the picture that I've shown you already. This is the picture with the model as I defined it, so no plateau. And there is still a plateau if the labels were generated with the structured data but the teacher would be acting on the input space. So we really need the teacher to be acting on the latent space. So, so okay, so this is, you know, demonstrating that kind of this model is a good model to go forward and, you know, something that I'm not showing you yet because the papers are not out yet that we, you know, want to solve it analytically and have these curves for what is the optimal generalization error, etc and to generalize, you know, and, and so this we kind of are working on and almost have. The second point kind of which I didn't touch at all in this talk, kind of the advantage of depth. So this is one point that is like very important, but which at least in, in the works kind of from statistical physics, we still don't know much beyond kind of the intuition that things are multi-scale and so the different layers are representing the different scales, kind of a solid evidence. We, we don't have much on to say on that, largely because we kind of don't know how to apply these calculations that know how to deal with the high dimension, but they don't know yet how to deal with the correlations in the hidden layers that seems to be challenging. So, you know, this is kind of bringing me back to one loop through this diagram. And the final conclusion is like physics has many useful tools applicable in high dimensional statistics, inference and learning. And if some of you are interested in some of these works, here is a list with the references. And this one I didn't really mention, but you know, this is kind of the other direction. Like physics is not uh, immune to machine learning and many physicists are applying machine learning to solve problems in physics. And we wrote a kind of extensive review about that recently. So if some of you are interested in that direction, you know, you may look at it. It will appear in, um, in reviews of modern physics, which is kind of the, you know, good old fashioned best like physics long reviews uh, journal. So that's, yeah, maybe I have one more slide for questions, or oh, slide, click for questions, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, so is there any questions? Yeah, okay, so thank you for this very nice talk, and I think it's not easy to bring together all these fields and, and tools uh, in, the same, in, in the same topic. Um, so I just want to check if you understood correctly. So basically for the teacher-student analysis, uh, you assume that the inputs are IID, the weights are also IID, but yes. probably uniform or according to yes. I don't know what distribution. From some distribution. And, and then, but the, the network may grow in deep uh, sublinearly, right? Has to be less than the, I mean, yes. it has to be O1 according to the number of samples. Yes. Um, so, um, I'm just, I don't understand uh, what's happening with this uh, hypothesis that we have that data belong to a lower dimensional manifold, which is 
perhaps due to the uh, uh, dependencies that you have in the spatial in the spatial space of the features, um, and here you you lost this. So how you, how we can recover this? Oh, yeah, so in the even last the end, five minutes, it, where yeah. I, which were going maybe too fast, I was trying to put it back. Right, that was exactly the. But point until you have two independent matrices, right? When you apply this, I mean, you did for the last. The, the one of the last yes. slides you say you have, you have a f no linear function that you apply to I two IID matrices in which you have like a type of bottleneck in between that yes. reduces dimensions but yeah, until the UID the data. Yeah, here yeah. the matrix F would be the features and C is the coefficients how much or not you're you're taking given feature. So 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 you can you know this this kind of language of features and C would be the co coordinates on the manifold and F would be defining the features of the manifold. So now yeah. yes here I am dealing with random IAD features so you know you like to have some meaning to your features but you see I cannot deal with some meaningful features because then I would lose completely the possibility to kind of carry out calculations to compute some the generalization error in some limit you know, analyze, what, for instance, what the gradient descent is doing up to constants. I just don't know how I would tackle it. So, so it's, you know, the F here is random, so it's kind of model for random features that l live in low dimensional subspace of the input space. So, you know, this is, we just introduced it and are studying it, right? So the question is, is this still missing something? Is there really something important about the features being structured in some way. So mm. probably yes, right? Probably you need some multi-scale hierarchical structure of these features for the multi-layers to be important. At least that's what the intuition say, but this is something that I don't think like anybody puts into you know, mathematical no, yeah, evidence. Not yet, yet. yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, so Last question, as usual. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, it's uh, for my understanding uh, too. Um, I didn't quite get uh, the interpretation of the vector and the tensor in the mm -hmm. in the. Um, sorry, looking at my notes in the um, algorithm uh, part. Yes. The, the y and the t. Uh, you seem to sample something somewhere, but I don't. Yeah, so this is kind of an inference problem that like lies in the class of say spike matrix models, etc., where the where the x star would be kind of a spike. People call it spike because if you looked at if you looked at the uh, um, eigenvalue decomposition of y, then depending on the size on the strength of the noise, there would be a outgoing eigenvalue from the bulk or not. But if you only had the matrix, so you see we observe a matrix that is this you know, vector times this. So if the noise was not there, this is a rank one matrix, right? And then you put noise there, and then this is only approximately rank one, and then basically, can you recover the spike? So this would be the classical problem that is considered in, say, statistics uh, in, in many, many papers. Now what we are, so, but this one is basically, you know, computing eigenvalues, so it's all a convex problem, nothing interesting really in the landscape. So to make it more interesting, we on the same spike observe a tensor. So take p equal three. So, so 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 this is a if you if you define the rank by exactly this decomposition, this is a rank one tensor. And again, you add noise, and you should be kind of able to recover the spike. So there is a spike tensor model that is not interesting for reasons you know that I can explain offline for for the purpose. But if we actually ob observe both on the same spike, then this gives us a model that we think ha you know has good. Uh, chance to have a generic kind of non-convex high dimensional landscape. So that's why we take this one. I don't know if it is answering your question, maybe I can, maybe you, yeah. can take it <laughs> offline. Okay, maybe I have, I have one, so I don't know. Uh, so uh, in your, anal your analysis, the kind of universal, u universal meaning that you are you are looking at this uh, large scale uh, limit and you do not make assumption about the difficulty of the task you solve, like conditional probability or, uh, or things like that. So in, in the case of the student teacher, you know that the problem is uh, you can solve it because you have generated uh, uh, the data, right? 
but uh, I would like to know if uh, in the statistical physics you can also consider the case where you have uh, a bit of knowledge about the, uh, the problem at hand, meaning some knowledge about the, the, the yeah, so so probability and or, or some knowledge about the uh, so we, we are not like assuming anything about yeah. the solvability but but in you know when I say that we solve the problem we basically by solving I mean that we get very detailed up to all constants understanding of whether it is information theoretically solvable so independently of algorithms and what these message passing algorithms are doing and you know for reasons that would be for another talk but that's kind of our surrogate for the best polynomial algorithm in these type of problems yeah. under the assumptions that we are you know putting there like random matrices etc so so this is in a sense giving a, a giving us access to the optimum and to the tractably reachable optimum and then you know that was the bottom part of my triangle the goal is to compare it with these like generic type of algorithms as the gradient descent and see how much worse they are and how kind of to make them work as good as they could by for instance over parametrizing etc so so yeah we are i mean we are not assuming but there is the noise and we kind of uh, get access to, to all this information which uh, which is something that kind of is uh, that we like okay it's very clear other questions okay if not we're going to to thank the speaker again Thank you.